in. All right. Welcome to House Church. My name's Alex. Thanks for being here. We're in a series going through Ecclesiastes, going through it very slowly, like one verse at a time. That's how slow. But uh, we took our time in chapter three. We're coming to a close of this like poem in chapter three. It's one of the most famous poems of all time, and it's about time. And this is our second to last week talking about time. But this week we're going to talk about repairing, repairing. There's this song by John Mayer called In Repair. It's on his album Continuum. And in it he says, I'm in repair, I'm not together, but I'm getting there. And that's the bridge. And I love that because only Christians can really sing that. Only Christians can really claim to be in repair, not there yet, but getting there. Because The Bible term for being in repair is sanctification. Sanctification is a process of becoming holy. Process of becoming holy. And that process comes as soon as you trust in Jesus. Uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians says stuff like every day the outer body is wasting away, but the inner body is being renewed day by day. How many of us know the outer body that we have sitting with us in these chairs is going to stay in the dirt, but the inner body is going to go on to live forever to be with the Lord. That's the part of us that is getting better. That's the part of us that is coming together, that's being repaired. And the thing about being repaired is God already sees you like your final product. God already sees you as if you're perfect and holy. That's the way that God sees you because that's what we've been declared in Christ. But the reality of it is that's, that's a reality that is It's a reality that is not yet completely experienced because we're still struggling with sins from day to day, with the flesh, with the world, with all this evil around us. The reality of it is we're stuck with that stuff and we feel it every single day. But how God sees you and what God declares you as is perfect. So we need to figure out what it means to be in repair. We need to figure out Um, what is our problem with being in repair? So if you look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 7, it says a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. So let's break down these verbs like we did last week. First off, it says a time to tear. Solomon is writing about everything that happens under the sun as a human. He's writing about the full scope of the human experience in verses chap- in chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes 1 through 8. And this week, he's talking about what it means to really mend and repair as a person. He's saying that in life, there's going to be times where you're going to have to tear stuff up. There's going to be times where you're going to have to uh, be a person that's torn away from the majority. And there's also going to be times to sow, to repair things, to bring things back together. There's also going to be times where you need to keep silent. And there's times where you need to speak up. These are all a part of the tick talk of life. Life goes tick, life goes talk, and it goes back and forth. Just like there's going to be a time to tear, a time to sow, a time to be silent, a time to speak. Now, what does he mean by this? And I have a, like about eight questions that, or so that I'm going to ask you throughout this message. So the first way of understanding what it means to like tear, what does it mean for the human experience to involve tearing. 2 Samuel chapter 1. 2 Samuel chapter 1. Let's look at the life of David. The life of David. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 1, we see a guy come running up to David. We're talking about King David, David and Goliath, slingshot, that guy. This guy comes running up with torn clothes up to David. And the news that he brings is that King Saul and Jonathan and the rest of his sons are dead. And back then in the Bible, you would tear your clothes out of two things, grief or repentance. So either something is grieving you so badly, whether it be the death of a loved one, or your sin is grieving you so badly, you would tear your clothes in repentance. It's a sign of what your sin is doing to you or what this news is doing to you. It's tearing you apart. And so you would physically tear your clothes. So this guy with torn clothes comes up to David. Then David tears his clothes and he starts to grieve over the loss of Saul and his best friend, Jonathan. Now, the question that this story is bringing up is what is tearing you from God? Solomon wants us to think about the times in our life where there's tearing or where there needs to be tearing. And so the first question is, what is tearing you away from God? Saul was tearing the people away from God. He was a bad king. 
So why would David mourn over the loss of this kind of king? It's because David is a man after God's own heart. Even though Saul was a bad king, David still loved Saul. He had the heart of Christ who loves his enemies. And so even though Saul was tearing these people away, David was still torn up over the death of Saul. So what is tearing you away from God? Put yourself in David's shoes. David knew it was big shoes to fill because this was Israel's first major king. And now David had to set up a system and where he was going to not tear the people away from God, but bring the people back to God. And that was a lot to go through. So what is tearing you away from God? Or better question, who is tearing you away from God? The thing is, when we answer that, we could say, oh, my boyfriend, oh, my girlfriend, oh, this person, oh, that person, oh, this streamer that I watch, whatever. You can point the finger at whoever you want and say, well, this person is pulling me away from God. The only person responsible for tearing you away from God is yourself. Look at me. You are responsible for tearing yourself away from God. You can shift the blame like Adam and Eve. Oh, it's the wife you gave me. It was the husband you gave me. You can point the finger all you want, but at the end of the day, you are not going to be able to stand there with whoever it is you're blaming at the judgment seat. And when God calls your name, you're not going to be able to say, oh, it's my neighbor. It was my ex-boyfriend. They really, you're not going to be able to do that. You are the one that is responsible for tearing yourself away from God. And if we look deeper, then we can look in our life and say, okay, what is it specifically that's tearing me away from God? And it's not about legalism. It's about being wise. It's not like a bunch of do's and don'ts. Christianity is not about that. What Christianity allows you to do, Christianity allows you to experience things to the fullest. Christianity is not about not having sex before marriage. It's about experiencing sex to the fullest, which is inside of marriage. Christianity is not about, oh, I don't want to be a glutton. It's about experiencing food to the fullest. We have a savior that says, think about me when you eat food. What other God says that? It's about experiencing stuff even more than what, your, what our shallow sins will, will have us do. Psalms 32, this is fast forward a little bit. David is now king and he commits adultery and he commits murder. Thank you. And as he does this, he starts to think about it. Psalm, this is not to be confused with Psalms 51. Psalms 51, you know, very, very famous. Created me, Lord, a clean heart. Like it's a very famous psalm. That was right after he committed adultery. Like right after he got the news where Nathan the prophet shows up and is like, you, you cheated on your wife and you also killed her husband. And he breaks down right afterwards. Psalms 32, even though it's a, a lesser number, you think it would come before. It comes much after where he's thought about what he's done for some time. Maybe a couple weeks, maybe a couple months, whatever. But he's thought about it for a while. In Psalms 32, he says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. What does he mean by that? Bones wasting away is a good thing. You need your bones to waste away. He was silent. He didn't talk to anybody. He didn't talk to God. He just like sat with his sin and thought about what he did. And he said it felt like his bones were wasting away. That, I mean, I had an auntie who died of leukemia. And it's like that. Your bones waste away. And it's, it's a terribly painful experience. Spiritually, that is what David is going through when he was silently thinking about what he had done. Because he says, even in Psalms 51, I sinned against you, God. But you sinned against Bathsheba. But you sinned against your, your Bathsheba's husband. You sinned against Israel. You sinned against all these other people. What are you talking about, David? He said, first and foremost, I sinned against you, God. Because when you sin against someone, yes, first and foremost, it's unto God. And so that's what he's doing. He's thinking about it and he's wasting away. We need to feel that. But we can't just stay there. We also have to speak up. So what David's life is showing us, because after that in Psalms 32, he says, I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. And then life returns to him once he spoke up to God. So Solomon if he had any relationship with his dad, which we know he did, he would have talked about these things with his dad and, that's, and thus he wrote about it in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. So he would have talked to his dad because Solomon's mom was the woman that David was in an affair with. So he would have had these like father, son, like you guys talked about birds and the bees. Awesome. Me and my dad talked about murder. 
Me and my dad talked about when I committed, like when he committed adultery with my mom. So they talked about some heavy stuff. Imagine growing up in this home. And so when he's saying there's a time to tear and a time to sow, he's saying, I've seen that in my dad's life. I've seen sins tear my dad up. And I've seen times where my dad was sowing back together the relationship between Israel and God as king. And then I've seen times in my dad's life where my dad was silent. And he was walking around the house with torn clothes and a long beard and ashes on his head because he was silently mourning what sin had done to him. But then I've also seen my dad wake up and speak up when he needs to speak up. A lot of us don't have dads like that. We lived in homes where our dads gave us the silent treatment. And when we needed to hear, our dad said nothing. And here we are in counseling because of that. Here we are needing a therapist because it's like, my dad didn't tell me the stuff I needed to hear. God shows you and gives you the power to speak up when you need to speak up. David understood that. There's a time for that. So what is God repairing in your life? Where is God putting silence in your life? Look at me. Where is God repairing your life? Look at your life and see where is God repairing me? But that's not all. Where is God putting silence in your life? What, come after, what came after the book of Malachi? Trick question. Nothing. It was 500 years of silence from God. And John the Baptist was the one that broke that silence. 500 years not hearing anything from God. Why? Because of Israel's sin. So where... Because of your sin, is it silent in your life? And then lastly, what is God speaking? Let's say God is speaking to you. What is he saying to you? So here's the solution. How are we going to be a person that is in repair? The solution is when God was sewing us back together, we were tearing away from him. You know, this part of the solution is we got to talk about the problem a little bit more. When God was sewing you back together, what we were doing is we were tearing away from him even more. Think about your life. Think about the decisions that you've made. When he was sewing you back together, what were you doing? You were ripping yourself away from him. When God was speaking to us, what did we say back to him? Nothing. When God was speaking to us and telling us what we needed to hear, what we were giving back to him was silence. When we should have been tearing, when there should have been repentance, when there should have been stuff that we're ripping, ripping apart, what were we doing? We were sowing. We're working on fixing our life, repairing this, repairing that. If I get a little bit of, a couple more stitches here, put these threads over here together, then my life will be all right. And what we should have been doing was ripping stuff apart. And then when we should have been you know, when we should have been silent, we're talking too much. Americans are great at this. When we should have been silent, we are speaking up. And we shouldn't have been speaking up. And then, when there was times when we should speak, we were being silent. Do you see how our clock is broken? Our hearts and our lives are supposed to be mimicking the tick-tock of, of this whole poem. Time to tear, a time to sow, a time to be silent, a time to speak up. But we're doing it wrong. Our clock is broken. It's talking when it should be ticking and ticking when it should be talking. But because Jesus was torn away from the Father on the cross, we can be sowed into God's family. That's what that is. The cross is Jesus being torn away from the presence of God so you could be sewn back into it. You were never supposed to live life apart from the presence of God. You were always supposed to live life with him all the time. That's why when you get saved, the first thing God does is inhabit you with his Holy Spirit because that's the way that you're always supposed to live. Dogs don't have that. Cats don't have that. Your hamster does not have that. I know you want your hamster to go to heaven. Your hamster's not going to to heaven. I'm not saying there's not going to be hamsters in heaven, but your hamster does not have the spirit of God living inside of him. I'm sorry God didn't think I really want to indwell a hamster. 
Instead, he chose to indwell you because you're made in the image of God to reflect his glory. And your heart is not going to rest until it rests in him. What you're trying to do is you're trying to let all the other spirits of the world inhabit you so you can feel something. Do you want to feel something? Let the spirit of God inhabit you. Because out of all the places God could have called his home, he chose your heart. So this is your problem, giving your heart to every weird little guy that smiles at you. <laughs> or weird, any weird little girl that likes your photo or watches your story. <laughs> Give me a break. God has asked that you would make your heart his home. Because he made it for that. And how much do you think God thinks about you? How much do you think he cares about you? If he's willing to make your nasty heart his home. He must be crazy about you. He must love you so deeply. That he want to live in there. And he does. Because heaven was quiet. While Christ was on the cross. Heaven can speak to us. The problem, though, is because God is holy, he has to punish sin, which means he, can't, he cannot just let us off the hook and be just. In order for him to be just or holy, he has to punish sin. So Christ comes up and he takes that for us. And so what we deserve is the silent treatment from heaven. We deserve no contact with heaven because of what we've done. So on the cross, an eternity amount of silence Babies can die from silence from their, pres their parents. I have a newborn. I've had six newborns. They can die if you don't speak to them, if you don't pick them up, if you don't have contact with them. I'm not talking spiritual death. I'm talking about physical death. Babies can die from that. So much so, on the cross, Christ experienced an endless eternity amount of silence and took death so you could hear God speaking to you. Not just once, but daily. And what is it that God is saying? Well done. What is it that God is saying? This is my child in whom I am well pleased. God is pleased with you because of Christ. That is absolutely crazy. That he's pleased with you because of what Christ has done. Because heaven was silent to Christ on the cross, heaven can speak to you. So going forward, where do we go from here? What is God asking you to tear away from? What is God asking you to tear away from? Because since Jesus was torn, there is nothing that can ultimately tear you away from God. That's what the gospel is. The resurrection of Christ is him standing after being torn away from God. It's him standing there in his glorified body saying, since I was torn away from God, there is absolutely, ultimately nothing that can tear you away from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So what can be repaired in your life by trusting God? I know there's a lot of things. If you're like me, you're like, where do I start? Look at your life and ask yourself, what can be repaired in my life by simply trusting God? That's all sin is. Refusing to trust God. What in your life can be repaired by trusting God? Because since Jesus has sewn you back together, there is no area of your life that is beyond repair. We really, like in a mental health age, we really like to, pity parties are like our favorite thing. And we're just, we have the cupcake with the one candle on it. The one little balloon with the upside down, the frowny face on it. And we love to sit, you know, in our pity party, in the mental health area. We never want to get up from our table because we think, if I don't blow my own candles, who's going who's gonna to sing to me? Who's going to sing me happy birthday? If I don't celebrate me, who's going to celebrate me? So I'm going to celebrate me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be at this party, a party of one, because no one else is going to come to the table. Well, you probably didn't invite anyone. But let's say you did and no one shows up. There's someone that always shows up and it's God. And the thing is, 
when you're having a birthday party, there's one person you really want to show up. Usually, whether you're eight, turning eight, nine, 12, whatever, there's one person that if this person shows up, it'll make your whole party. Call it a crush. Call it your, your coach, maybe. I don't know who it is for you, who it was back then. But God is that one person. If there's two million people at your birthday party, God is that one person that he shows up, the party's made. And he's there for you. And so as you look at your life, do not ever start to think that you are beyond repair. That there is an area of your life that will not be fixed and cannot be fixed no matter how hard you try. That's not true for a Christian. Because Christ went through all that work to sow you back into a relationship with God. There is no area, look at me, there is no area of your life that is beyond repair. Don't allow the devil or your own flesh because don't forget, the flesh hates you just as much as the devil hates you. If you want to look at who hates me the most, the flesh hates you probably equally as much as Satan hates you. And the flesh will try to convince you that I am beyond repair in this one area. And that is not true. You can experience repair. You can experience restoration. That is the promise of the resurrection. And God will put people in your life. This is what the church is. God is, the church is God putting mechanics in your life. You know that, right? The church is God putting extra mechanics in your life to where you get to a problem that you can't fix. There's someone sitting next to you that says, hey, I'll take it from here. Alex, I know exactly what you need to hear. Alex, I know, you know, you're struggling with this area. You can't get this thing to fit. I'm going to help you in this area. That's what the church is. That's what makes us a family, working together, repairing together. Where is it time to be silent? Where is it time to be silent? Is there silence in your life? Are you not hearing from God? You will not experience more silence. Listen to this. You will not experience more silence than that of the grave that, God, that Christ experienced. You've heard the phrase, more silent than the grave? Where do you think that comes from? Jesus going to the grave and coming back. And you, there may be silence in your life. You will not experience more silence than Christ experienced in the grave. So let it go. If it's silent right now, let your bones waste away. Feel it. Feel it. Knowing that it's not going to be more silent than what Christ experienced in the grave. Amen? And last question, what do you need to speak? What do you need to speak? What do you need to speak? Since God has spoken to us through his son, there is nothing too difficult for you to speak. There's going to be a lot of areas in your life where you are going to have to have conversations that you do not want to have. When you're going to have to say stuff to yourself that you don't want to say to yourself. Or say, someone, say something to someone close to you that you do not want to say. Maybe that person scares you. Maybe conflict scares you. You got to knock it off. Because listen, Christ has, God has spoken to us through his son. He hasn't spoken to us through like a pigeon or a text message or an email. He sent his son to speak directly to you. That's a big deal. I'm not trying to be political. I just don't know Biden's son's name. Oh, Hunter, yeah. So if Hunter or Baron Von Trump came to my house and was like, Alex, I got a special message from you or for you from the president. I'm not going to put him on hold. I'm not going to be like, even if I'm just, you know, in my board shorts, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to give him my entire attention. Are you guys tracking with me? God has not spoken to you. God is infinitely different. I hope that I don't have to even say that than the President of the United States. Eternally different. <laughs> but to say the least, that's, that's even like a, what is that? An understatement. But to say the least, God has spoken to you through his son. Not a messenger pigeon, not a text message, not a friend of a friend of a friend or a family member that's distant, weird cousin that you never talked to. God has spoken to you through his son. And if God has spoken to you through his son,
there is absolutely no conversation that's too difficult for you. You can do it. There's no message that you need to share that is too scary or too high and lofty or you're just not ready for. You can do it because of what he's done for us. Still prepare. Don't just go in there guns blazing into that conversation. Don't just start shooting the lights out inside your own head. Think about it. This is why silence is important. Did you see that? That's why you have to have the tick and the talk. You can't just, just be just one of them. Prepare, but then say what needs to be said. Either to you or whoever it is that God is calling you to be. Ultimately, it's unto the world. Christians are people who are not just called to repair the earth. Christians are people who are called to be silent and called to speak up when they need to speak up. Because the devil's not going to say it. The flesh is not going to say it. You, sometimes you're not even going to say it unless the Spirit of God is empowering you to say it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we ask right now that when we take communion that you would speak to us. When we take communion that we would use this time to be silent. That we use this time to hear from you. And that we would use this time to see the areas of our life where we need to be torn. Areas of our life that need repair, need sowing. And we thank you for what the cross has given us the power to do. In your name we pray, amen. Amen.